Hello, and welcome to the EMS Improv Podcast, where we engage, where we are mindful, and we tell or share our stories. I'm Eric Chase. We are powered by GEMS. Today's guest is a firefighter, well, was a firefighter, if I just found out, uh, is a paramedic, he's an artist, and he's a keynote speaker, and most importantly to me and how I reached out to him or why I reached out to him is he is a mental health advocate. All those things put together uh, gives us a fantastic guest and an opportunity for me to engage with you today is uh, Daniel Sundahl. Daniel, welcome to the EMS Improv Podcast. Great. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me on. So firstly, um, you're my second international guest, so I want to just say thank you to that and bravo to Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> our, our, our good, happy, uh, smiling, uh, polite friends up to the north. Yeah, we're very polite, yes. Yes. So thank you very much for that. I guess as, as we started talking and just before kind of I was unaware that uh, you had had to uh, stop firefighting. And mm -hmm. is that something that you'd be willing to share uh, yes. briefly with the audience? Yes. So I had, uh, I was first diagnosed with PTSD in 2014. And that's actually when I started creating the artwork. And, and that helped tremendously. And then a few years ago, I started getting new symptoms because I was still being exposed to the trauma. So I started developing new symptoms, which I recognized. And eventually it started to affect my job uh, as, as a paramedic as well. And uh, so I got help. And then this, after getting assessed and getting poked and prodded, my psychologist said, yeah, you're not going back to work uh, in emergency services. So I'm like, oh, okay, well, crap. Now what am I going to do? So I'm... I'm still registered as a paramedic, uh, and I'm going to keep that because I worked really damn hard to get that. And um, and uh, but yeah, I'm no longer working uh, on the front line. And you know, I think I was ready, but it wasn't by my my choice. I was hoping I can stick it out at least a few more years. But yeah, that's what kind of happened. So now I'm on to on to other things. I'm back in school, learning to become a psychotherapist. And when I'm done, I graduate next year. I'm going to help our peers with substance abuse and addiction, secondary to trauma, um, interpersonal relationship issues, secondary to trauma, grief, secondary to trauma, and of course, the effects of trauma itself. So that's kind of my goal. Wow. Um, thank you. And thank you again. Uh, as I was feeling what you were saying, and, and where I started becoming more healthy is that I was starting to integrate my feelings to actual emotions as opposed to just suppressing them or masking them with drugs, uh, alcohol, whatever things that, that we as humans use to disassociate and, and, and move away from. Um, one of the things that just screamed and raged at me uh, was what's my identity going to be now? And that's mm -hmm. what I felt. And I'm just curious if any of that came into your existence from your mind, spirit, body, soul, and you felt that in any kind of way and how you've been dealing with that aside from the moving forward and be in schooling and university for psychotherapy and all that kind of stuff. What was yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's very common for many of us, for I think many emergency workers, maybe even many people who are really passionate about the work that they do, they become, that's that's their identity. And, you know, for my side, I don't want to talk on behalf of other people, but for me, I was a paramedic. I was a firefighter. You know, who are you? Well, I'm a paramedic, I'm a firefighter. So when I'm told I can't do that anymore, yeah, that's a big, that's a big shocker. Like, well, then if I can't do them, what's my identity? And that's, you know, I'm learning a lot of how powerful that is, of who we think we are, we actually are, and how much of a, of a bond that ha that has on us psychologically. So, and then how, how crucial or precarious that moment is when you're told you can't essentially be who you are anymore. You know, then what are you going to do? And then all the effects that happen from that. I think many of us really struggle with that moment. Okay, well, now what are we going to, what are we going to do? And yeah, it's a really difficult thing. So for me, yeah, that was difficult. Luckily for me, I, I have my dance on work, which I'm always going to do. So even as a psychotherapist, I'm still going to be doing my dance on stuff all the time. It's probably going to change in nature because my artwork is a reflection of, of my experiences. Uh, but I'm now at the phase where, you know, I'm very grateful. I'm very excited. I haven't been this excited about learning something new 
And since I was back in school learning to become a paramedic 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And uh, it's really exciting. I feel like I have a, a new vigor for life and starting over with a new career. However, I don't feel like that's going to be my identity. I don't have the attachment of my identity to my career anymore. Now I'm Daniel Sundahl and I am working toward, and I'm an artist and I am a mental health advocate and I am working toward being um, a counselor to help my peers, but that's not, my identity is separate from what I do. And I, well, I'm only talking for myself, but I feel I'm better for it. Um, my identity is separate from what I do. And, and that resonates in my spirit uh, significantly is I've had to make transformations and, and gone, gone through personally gone through counseling and EMDR and, and, um, and, and therapy in those regards. I was always the badge or the uniform or something and, and not, not even looking at retirement, whether it be medically mental health perspective or a full on, you know, getting your full pension after 25, 30 years, wherever that would be. And to hear you say that is, is, you know, so profoundly healthy um, that it it concerns me for those that aren't in the position that you were with some of the support structure and those other things that you have to quote unquote. Some people are going to say fall back onto. For you, they were a part of who you were anyhow. So I don't know if, if you considered a fallback or a backsliding into them. They were still also almost separate but equal as to who you were. You just had to realize that in yourself. So for people that are out there hearing your story and have heard other stories, and this may be a culmination for them to maybe see an opportunity to take some action for themselves to self-identify with the person that they want to be or be their most authentic self, what was one or two of the things that you really had to reflect upon as you were going through this transition and to see um, that, or somebody maybe had to point out to you that you finally had to feel or see that was going to help get you through that that point where you were given a situation where you didn't really have a choice or say in the matter that's a good question and there's lots of examples probably the biggest and again i'm not telling people what they should do i'm not recommending anything but i'm just sharing my own lived experiences of having that attachment to my career and Probably the biggest, well, the most probably profound negative aspect of that, which ended up in the end of my marriage, actually, was, was I would, an example is when I was at work, I would put, is where I, I put my energy. So when I was at work and we moved to those new safety catheters, um, I just put so much energy into that. I couldn't get IVs and I blamed everybody. I'm like, oh, what's going on? But you know, if things happened at work, if they changed the smallest thing at work, I'd put a ton of energy in that. And I think because that was my identity and you're messing with my identity. Yet when I would go home and my wife would ask me for my opinion or, you know, efforts in other part, I didn't want to do anything. I'm like, you know, I don't want to make any decisions. I don't want to. So I wouldn't put any energy there because I was so exhausted for putting so much at work. And when I would go home, I was still a paramedic firefighter. And I I had to learn the hard way to leave my profession at home or at work. And then when I go to go home, then I'm no longer a paramedic firefighter when I'm away from the fire hall. I'm a husband, I'm a dad. That's where I should put my energy. And I just kind of learned that too late. And um yeah, I think that's that's kind of was a bit a bit of an eye-opener for me and it was really kind of a hard lesson for me to to learn and uh i'm not definitely not gonna do that again so and again thank you um one of the things and, and i think it's very important to hear um from somebody with your experience or or when you hear it on this podcast and, and on gems is that you're you're clearly not giving advice you're you're not their professional you're not their therapist you're not their counselor their psychiatrist and and i just i appreciate you prefacing your, your statements with that you have been in places where you have a, a way out where you know a way out based upon your lived and shared experiences and then the people and the resources around you 
So what I hear you saying is there are opportunities for each of us. You're giving a perspective based upon your lived experience. And that may not be, and it may not be the healthy way for someone else. Um, so we also don't want people to feel more beat up or, or piled on when you're talking about a story that you've been able to relatively successfully come through or be working through, whereas they're still in, in a position here. So when we talk about don't compare trauma as well, you know, don't compare good things or bad things because uh, you're going to either feel guilty or you're going to feel uh, jealous and, and potentially. So I appreciate you just prefacing that and being so thoughtful and, and letting people know that um, you, you're talking about you and, and not something that may or, it may work for them, but you're not also giving them uh, professional advice and in, in, in what to do. Yeah, how to you do know, it. even even as a you know, once I am a licensed counselor, I and when I deal with my clients or helping my clients, I'm still going to make that approach of shared experience, lived experience, but then also just share. Okay, well, this is what research says we should do, um, but keeping that connection as a peer and lived experience, I think is very powerful, more powerful in my opinion, than no matter how many letters I have after my name. It's it's having that shared lived experience and being a living example of not only surviving PTSD, but really thriving from it. And now going into this post-traumatic growth that I'm actually better than I was before because and because of my trauma, that almost killed me has actually made me a better person than I was before. I'm doing things now that I never thought I would have done if it wasn't for that trauma, those traumatic experiences. So I'm very grateful for that. You, you said something and it's, it's on uh, the website where I found this as well. And one of the sessions that you provide um, is called uh, post-traumatic growth. And would you speak a little bit more into that and kind of what the offerings are and, and how you know, each person is going to have their own aha moments. It's, it's all what I say when I do a presentation as well. Um, but yet you still have to put objectives up and to get CEUs or CMEs or whoever's in attendance. Um, for you to say that and for you to know that, and it's, it's like a visceral thing now for you, you know that you would never have done X and Y had you not experienced those horrifying things that you witnessed, bared witness to or, or dealt with or were put upon you. Um, in a, in a couple of minutes, if you would just share without giving away your entire presentation uh, to entice uh, an individual down here in the States or up there uh, in an organization that maybe knows who you are, but doesn't know what you really do or can offer them, uh, yeah. what post-traumatic growth means. Yeah, it's a th that whole story, even sharing my artwork was a bit of a weird story. And I do share that in that presentation. So that presentation is really my own experiences of what happened to me. I share the artwork. Uh, of how my artwork helped me. And then I share how better I am because of uh, those traumatic experiences and the artwork. And then I share the techniques or the things that I do and still do to be as mentally healthy as I can be. But it was never my intention to share my artwork. It was never my intention to speak about it. Uh, initially, there was a conference, I think it was in North Dakota, I think, who wanted me to exhibit my artwork. And I'm like, oh my God, that's great. I would love it. And so they invited me there. I went there, shared the images and people were asking me why I created them. And so I would share them, share like, this is why I do this. It's how I purge these organic monsters in my head and trap them in these two-dimensional pictures. And I'm what I'm learning now is that I'm actually reconsolidating those memories so that I can have the memory without the emotional response to it. At the time, I had no idea what was happening in my brain, but when I explained the reason for creating them and they're all very personal to me, people would say, Hey, you should really share that story because people would want to, they might connect with that and feel that they're not alone. I'm like, I don't think people would want to listen to why I create the artwork, but I was wrong. So I did. And yeah, since then, my presentation has grown. That one is specifically my own experiences as a peer, and I share the artwork and the story behind some of them, and then share how much better I am because of the trauma. And since then, now I do a presentation on controllable versus non-controllable stressors. 
I do presentation. I built a workshop on um, peer support support, helping peer support members. Uh, I do a, a memorial portrait every day on a separate page. And people don't tell me how these people, how these emergency workers have died. I don't ask. It's not important for me to create the artwork for them. But often they tell me. And I was shocked to see how many peer support members have died by suicide until I started thinking about it. I thought, well, yeah, well, that's like a double whammy stressor for peer support members, like CISA members or peer support people that are working in that environment, helping their peers. They have the stress of their own work, plus the added stress of helping their peers. So I did a lot of research on that. Um, I'm applying a lot of the things that, I'm, that I've worked in school. I've consulted with, with a lot of uh, people that are experts in that field and have built um, a workshop on that. So I'm gonna, I'm doing that as well, uh, specifically for peer support members. So yeah, it's kind of grown into this. I get to travel the world now and, and present my artwork exhibit and speak on mental health for emergency workers. It's great. I will echo that. It, it is great. And without voices like yours and artwork like yours, and, and you're able to share and show it from a perspective where we don't have to just be so cognitively and linearly focused is, is missionally intent now, you know, missional purpose, driven missional drive, and, and those motivations and factors that really kept us in the dark and, and profoundly exacerbated in many cases, a lot of our pain, trauma, guilt, shame, all those responses that we would do. And you talked about it with your wife. I'm divorced. Um, I have a second wife going on nine years that uh, I make many less of those mistakes that I had made uh, and, and, and yet still need to be called out periodically. And, and that was a big thing too, is uh, for her with me is normalizing accountability conversations and how we do that from a peer support standpoint, a SISM team, uh, relationships, personal relationships, or even on the job, um, you know, peer to peer, subordinate uh, leader, leader to subordinate, and, and really being much more radically transparent and vulnerable um, in order to support one another the best that we can on the most human base level. Because um, not knowing what people are going through, or you know, when you start talking about the impact of the cumulative trauma that, uh, that the peer support leaders are also carrying, um, where they're often less inclined to share theirs, um, because they need to be the helper in, in that moment. So I'm grateful to hear that your work also has benefited and is going to be benefiting those individuals. Um, and for the reasons, uh, and most profoundly is the suicidality that we've seen such an uptick in and in, in, in those groups. Um, let's let's uh, go another corner for a second. We, we've been getting a little heavy. Um, and, and getting a little bit real, which, and, which is good and it's important. Um, I want to lighten it up a little bit. Um, for those of you that can't see, I, I see guitars. There's uh, at least four or five that are behind Daniel, and you won't see that because it's not a uh, vlog uh, podcast. It's uh, just a audio podcast. Music, and why is that important to you, and how is music important to you uh, in thriving and in, in living and in, in, in finding joy in your life? Yeah, Eric, before we go into that, I, I do want to mention – because you did mention things were getting a little bit heavy, and they were. But I like the concept, and I've created artwork on it, of the idea of being tragically optimistic. And what I mean by that is to acknowledge the heavy stuff. I think it's really important to acknowledge the heavy stuff and talk about it. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be... I know it's hard not to be. But I can talk about those things and still be optimistic about it. My sister told me once when I was, when I was told I couldn't go on the ambulance anymore, I was, couldn't work in the fire department. Uh, my wife left me. I sold my dog. My dad, I sold my house. I had someone else. My dog died. My dad died all within a short period of time. My world was upside down. And my sister said, well, Daniel, well, one door closes, another one opens. I'm like, yeah, Carrie, I know that. But then she said, but no one tells you the hallway's on fire. And I'm like, yeah, isn't that the truth? Like my, I am in a burning hallway right now. And to be tragically optimistic is to recognize that you're in a burning hallway, but to also know that there's a door there and there's an exit and to work toward it. And then when you get out, 
acknowledge that burning hallway, but still be optimistic about it. I did this one art piece, a big cherry blossom tree, uh, specifically on that topic. But uh, yeah, so to get back to that, it's um, I think it's important to acknowledge those things uh, and but still be optimistic about that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Yes. As far- Oh, can, can I can I uh, take us back on that path for a second? Then, sure. Uh, so, for people that don't know, um, we do not pre-plan, and I've never pre-planned uh, a conversation. Daniel and I literally just met uh, thirty-five minutes ago via Zoom, and I, I want to say when I went to pivot, and, and this wasn't something that we had cooked up, uh, and, and it does bear in line with generally who I want to be is, is dealing with the things in the moment to get through them as opposed to being, so there's that whole, the the bull versus the cow going into the storm head first, you still deal with all the consequences, everything you just are, you're going through it head first. You're, you're seeing what you're seeing and you're dealing with it as opposed to walking away from it, ultimately fearing what's going to be coming and having the anxiety of dealing with it. So when I mentioned, yes, it is getting heavy um, for you to stay on course and on topic enough to push the point thoughtfully let's be tragically optimistic and recognize where we are and why that's where you add the value of your presentation and what i believe you'll do when when you're a therapist and a counselor Um, because it's easy to stop when it gets a little bit difficult and whether that it's it's the analogy of the hallways on fire and there's an exit right here, or I'm escaping it from my mind and I'm really not getting rid of it. I'm just not dealing with it again. And I'm going to yeah. pay the piper many more fold uh, as a result of not having dealt with it again this time. And a lot of times it's the guilt and shame response. And particularly it has been and was in me that because I didn't do it or I said, you know what? here's a good little segue to get away from this and I can be positive again. Yet it's an avoidance tactic as well. And yeah, for so, years, sorry, go ahead. No, go, no, please go. No, you were, you were on a, you're on a roll there, Eric, keep going. Well, well being on that whole avoidance <laughs> tactic, right. You know, it, it's, I gave myself an opportunity to either continue or I was feeling some kind of way. And I said, Hey, this has been heavy forgetting about what the listeners are doing or even why we do this, engage, be mindful, share and tell your stories. The story wasn't over. And I was away, I was willing to kind of go over here. And so no, that's, go ahead, please. That's where, that's where the good stuff happens. The good stuff happens in the difficult moments. And, you know, I'm learning that in school and I'm actually on practicum. It's, it's very similar. My schooling to paramedics, I actually have a practicum, which is great. And I'm learning that, you know, in those heavier moments, that's when change happens. It's like the road that's less traveled, that's where the most rewards are. And for years and years and years, I was a toxic positivist, which is the opposite of a tragic optimist, uh, uh, being tragically optimistic. So if I was being a toxic positivist, meaning that I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine you know, avoiding the heavy stuff, sweeping stuff under the rug until, you know, it started to bubble over and I tripped on that rug because there's so much stuff underneath it. So I, and I, I, sometimes I forget because I speak about my experiences and I speak about uh, so many tragic things, depression, suicide, the heavy stuff that I'm so used to talking about it. And in a, in a positive, optimistic way that sometimes I forget that other people aren't the same that way. And sometimes I need to remind myself, and maybe just acknowledge that, okay, this is why it is getting heavy, but let's still be optimistic. Let's not forget that there is a way out. There is potential benefit to having these experiences and recovering and rebuilding neural pathways and pruning over those old pathways if you do the work, which sometimes isn't always easy, but the benefits can be incredible when we talk about post-traumatic growth. So I love hearing that. So uh, post-traumatic growth and and let's be tragically optimistic. And and you just sang my swan song, if you said anything (laughs) else, reshaping those neural pathways. So art, improv, music, brother, we're doing those things. And people 
people are afraid of the feels sometimes. And, and I get that. Some people, it's hard for them to attach to the feels. Where I've become the most radically transparent, authentic, most adaptable is utilizing and knowing that when I have right brain, left brain integration, and I, that left prefrontal cortex is opening itself up to the opportunity of an experience as uncomfortable as it could be, when, when my amygdala and hippocampus are firing and I'm in fight, flight, or freeze because I'm doing a silly game, and yet I get through that, and then I see that there's a pathway out, my neural responses are changing. And mm-hmm. so for me to review and reflect upon the art that you've done and I've seen and I've felt and I've bawled my eyes out uh, and, and smiled and laughed in the same picture that you've done, in the same art that you've done across the board, I'm able to see things in their worst state and then not also be consumed by it at this point. And so when you say changing those neural responses and neural pathways, you know, this isn't hocus pocus. This isn't mumbo jumbo. And we're proving oh. it science, mm-hmm. as you know, studying psychology and, and my study of psychology, um, you know, an action plus, or empathy plus action is compassion. And the more compassion we give, the less burnout we're actually going to be. And there's studies all over now from some great people and leaders in, in, uh, in the world of uh, empathy and, and, and compassion, where we're learning that the more you lean into that, even in your own hardships, mm-hmm. The, the less burnout you're going to be, the more fulfilled you're going to uh, have. So I'll yeah, be quiet again. Yeah, okay. it's about the connection. Yeah. Right. And I think going back to the creativity part is, is if you can interrupt that HPA access, which is the normal automatic part of your brain that is meant to protect you. So it's a good thing. It's there so that you don't have to think, oh, there's... You know, there's a, a bear coming out of the woods. Is this dangerous? Maybe I should run. You don't even think about it. You just do it, right? There's automatic responses to it where when we relive those traumatic experiences, same thing happens. We we think about it and then we have the emotional and physical responses to it. Whereas if you can access that while you're, you're interjecting with another part of your brain in a creative way, for me is how it was, then I'm able to interrupt that access or that automatic response. So I don't have that physical and emotional response to that memory. And I didn't realize that's what I was doing, but that's what I did with my artwork. I do the same thing with my music. So you mentioned all the guitars in my room here and I play guitar. I play music. I'm not very good. So nobody invites me around the world to play my guitar for them because I'm not great at it, but it's very therapeutic for me the same way because I'm activating that, um, creative part of my brain and while I'm being very emotional when I play my music. So it's a very, and I'm building new neural pathways. So yeah, it's uh, for me, the creative aspect. Well, it really saved my life really. And that's the tricky part. It's different for everybody, right? It's different. It's hard to, it's hard to know what's going to work for you. It's not to say you need to break your femur. Okay. Well, depending where the break is and the severity, there's, you know, the accepted, treatments and surgical techniques that you're going to use that's pretty standard but for us you know when we break our minds it's kind of different for everybody you know for for somebody it's being in nature it's exercise it's they turn to maladaptive they drug use or addiction or but everybody is a little bit different as to what a healthy coping mechanism is going to be and sometimes it's not always easy to figure that out um, hearing you say that, and, and just because you threw out HPA, and, and for those that are listening, um, we want to just make uh, put it in, in bigger context. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or HPA, is the main stress response system, the neuroendocrine uh, link between the perceived stress and the physiological reaction to stress. So that's what Daniel was talking about. Oh, yeah. Um, so just to kind of put that out there, everything that Daniel's done and is feeling, it, it's, it's rooted also in science and psychology and personal shared lived experiences. So um, again, it's important, the stories are great. And yet what we offer the listeners are something that that, that also provides them a a greater opportunity for uh, self awareness and understanding of of things that people are doing or the science and the psychology behind it. So I wanted to thank you for letting me just kind of uh, articulate what that was for people that may go, well, HPA, that means nothing to me. It's like elemental P. Um, mm-hmm. So he is speaking uh, 
very, very truthful and, and very knowledgeable to to the points and and how things are, are working and being affected by uh, the traumas and, and those things that we experience. I love that you mentioned that nobody's paying you to to travel the world to to pay your guitar, and yet and yet it still gives you the benefit that, mm -hmm. that you need, and. And that's the singular most important thing that I think that if I could share anything from this particular podcast is that people need to find those things that are intrinsic and individual to them, because my joy is not going to be in, in the same, the pathways that I seek to find my joy are not going to be the same pathways that other people have. And, and, you know, so many people want to mimic and copy and, 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 and do those things. And, and that's good as long as it's a healthy mimicking and to see, and then they can realize that this isn't helping me as much as it needs to be, and then finding another opportunity. Um, you look like you want to say something. I know there's things on on your heart and mind, so I, I would love to have you just kind of riff right there if you if you can. I haven't asked you a question, but what's going on in your mind? Yeah, I know it's. Um, I was just thinking that one of the things that I learned when I do the when I was doing the research on the peer support support workshop that I do when I was talking to to people that know more about those things than I do what they recommend people do is that they learn a new instrument we're talking about the creative part of the brain it doesn't matter what it is uh, you could buy a used instrument on line somewhere and you can probably learn to play anything for free on YouTube and I think that's really important. And the idea is that it's you're activating and you're you're the creative part of your brain. You are building new neural pathways that way. And I'm gonna learn to play the cello. How hard can it be? It's only four strings, right? It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the big deal is. How hard is it, right? Maybe there's no frets, maybe there's a little bit of that, but but I love the sound of the cello and I'm gonna rent one and I'm gonna learn how to play it on on YouTube. Um and the day that I learned to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star on the Cello, I'm going to be super happy. I'm proud of myself uh, from building those new neural pathways and starting something new. So when I have time, that's on my list. Um, and it doesn't have to be, it could be whatever you want. The kazoo, the xylophone, whatever, guitar, piano, uh, whatever it is, it's good to, even if you don't think, again, I'm not, I don't want to tell people what to do. This is the advice that I was given and I can see the merit in it. And um I think doing those kind of things are are important. And maybe when we're talking about it's difficult to find what really works well for you, maybe if you feel that you don't really even need something like that, it's a good maybe resiliency skill that you can maybe do that. So maybe you're not full-blown PTSD, you can't work, but you have a stressful job. You, know, you, have, you, you deal with stressful things. That could be one of them. And of course, the equine therapy with horses. There's tons of different things that in that in that lecture that I give. So I don't like to call it a lecture, that presentation I give on post-traumatic growth. When I travel around the world, I talk to my peers and I always ask them, okay, what do you do to relieve your stress? And then I add it to a list. The list isn't best practice, it's not research-based, but these are things that our peers have told me that. They have done and it helps them. And that's what makes it on the list. So every time I travel and I give that presentation, I, when I come to that part, I tell people if there's something that's not on this list that you that um you've tried that's really helped, let me know. Come up to me later and I'll talk to you about it and I'll do some research on it. And then I'll add it to the list. I love that. You know, we hear all too often. And I don't know for men versus women where, you know, I can, I can speak specifically about my wife and me. But she's like, I don't need you to agree with me. I just need you to accept that this is how I'm feeling. I need you to validate my feelings, my issues, my concerns, my emotions. Don't fix me. Don't try to fix me. Don't have a response. Just literally be present. And what I'm hearing is, is that you're also offering in your presentations because it is shared their opportunity to participate and engage with you which then also i feel is validating to them and it may have been the first opportunity they've been vulnerable enough to reach out and say well i've tried this and it's worked in the past and whatever the case may be but now they can see that as a part of your presentation 
and to know and to feel hopefully some sort of positive way that they've been included, uh, that their share as small as they think it may be on the magnitude compared to what you do or presentations that we do, it's still equally as important. And, and for each of us to find that and, and to have that strength and, and understanding and acceptance of, of what's going on around us. And we don't have to always agree with the things that are going on around us, of course, but to be able to accept that and to validate that. And, and I love the point that you mentioned about picking up uh, and learning the, the cello and any of us in any part of a, a learning, coping, resiliency uh, mindset can do this and it can be beneficial. And I, I've been amazed at, at where this conversation has gone, having no idea where it would have gone and yet it's going exactly where it needs to go. So I'm great. <laughs> I'm grateful for, for your sharing and, and your continued passion and your desire to help in, in completing schooling in a year. Um, what university are you attending? If you want to name it, it's uh, at Denver College out of Vancouver. Out of Vancouver. Yeah. Okay. So it's a two-year full-time program. Uh, and yeah, I love it. It's not specific to trauma, but the stuff I'm learning what I'm really doing is psychoanalyzing myself, every program, every course that I take. I'm like, oh, that's what happened to me. Oh, that's why I did that. You know, that's why I was behaving that way. That makes total sense. And it's like, oh, okay, this is what I, if I would have known this, this is what I would have done. This is how I can process these things. This is how techniques I could use. And it's funny you say that, uh, you know, acceptance is a big thing. A lot of the modalities that I'm reading, that I'm learning about, uh, you know, acceptance and commitment are a big part of the many of the new wave tech uh, modalities for psychotherapy and the couples therapy that I'm going to use is integrative behavioral couple couples therapy, which they use at the VA. And uh, I think it's going to be very effective for couples that are having issues secondary to trauma because a big component of it is accepting each other for who we are and committing to move forward. And for me, in my case, and for many of our peers that I've spoken with that are having issues with their interpersonal um, problems is, is they don't, how can I, maybe this is a better example. When I would have a rough day at work, I would come home and I just didn't want to feel anything. I didn't want to make any decisions. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to go to bed. And then my wife would would see that as me not engaging with her. Um, my sex drive was low. I was angry. So of course she's going to see that her perception is going to be that I don't love her. But the reality was I didn't love anything. Mm. It wasn't just her. It was everything, but she didn't see it that way. Of course she didn't see it that way. So a lot of it is with the modality I'm going to use for, for couples therapy the integrative behaviors, couple therapy, that is all kind of, kind of out in the open. You know, what stresses do you bring into the relationship? What stress, what um, characteristics do you bring in from past relationships, from your childhood? How do you communicate? Uh, and that's all kind of brought up in the open and everyone knows. And the emphasis is on accepting each other because of it and committing to moving forward, which I think is is really great. A big reason why I really want to work with couples for my own experiences, but uh, my friend, Dr. Olivia Johnson, who works, who does the, do you know her? Yeah, she's fantastic. She actually wrote the forward of my, of my new art book. I saw that. I can't wait to get it. <laughs> oh, she's so, she's so great, but she has the fatal 10 and the fatal 10 is she investigates police suicides and she's come up and she's done probably, I'm sure over a thousand of them. And she's come up with these fatal 10 or the most common factors of the many that she looks at when she investigates suicide. And the number one risk factor, the one number one common risk factor for police suicides is interpersonal relationship issues. And the number two is substance abuse and addiction. And number three is cumulative stress. So those are the areas that I really want to work on. Because if I can help people with those issues, it potentially could prevent their suicide based on the data that Dr. Johnson's doing at the Blue Wall Institute. So that's why I'm really focusing on those areas. 
yeah, the, knowing that, hearing that, listening to her, uh, being friends with different organizations that are working in law enforcement or fire, EMS, communally, collectively, uh, Warriors Rest, um, Save Call Now, Dr. Johnson, um, you know, just so, so many great people doing great work and, and finally starting to really connect and integrate uh, what we're learning and seeing to benefit everyone and, and not just being so uh, isolated or, or focused, at least in the, in the learning. Now, training I still get. I have a law enforcement background and, you know, it's very easy to silo ourselves, you know, because of the mindset you have to have or the or what's been going on in your world. Um, same thing as fire, EMS, dispatch, and, and, and so on. But I just love that we continue to integrate these knowledges, uh, the, the, the learning, the, the data, the, the research, and, and the trainings across all of these uh, first response and, and uh, veteran organizations so that more people are getting the best, the cutting edge, the newest, uh, most helpful and beneficial um, to me, my, my belief anyhow, um, therapy, counseling, training, mm -hmm. uh, activities that will help change neural, neural pathways and neural responses. And it's amazing. I, I did a presentation uh, with the Veterans and First Responder Organization on Sunday, and the therapist that spoke just before my part of the presentation where we see these activations of, of feelings and emotions in a low-stakes environment. The big thing that she talked about was how to reparent yourself and, and inner child healing exercises and, and going through some of what you spoke about um, because we leave so much on the table um, from a trauma standpoint and unresolved trauma uh, standpoint if we don't go all the way down there now the immediate things you know the immediate life safety issues and concerns and how i'm going to get through tomorrow and next week always important but to know and feel and see personally and, and other therapists that i work with and go to that are asking me questions about what i see and dealt with in my past and for me to be comfortable enough to articulate them feel them experience them safely um, similar to what you do with the art, you know, from the real world to the 2D expressions, it's it's safely encapsulated now, and you can deal with that on your own as you need to deal with it. And it's the same place that I put things away through my EMDR and therapy um, in my mind's eye um, that are just is produce the same visceral feelings, and yet for me it wasn't art as it is for you. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of that, and we're coming up on on where listeners start kind of wanting to go, this has been great. Um, and at the same time, they're kind of ready to give in. And so mm -hmm. with that, I want to honor them and be mindful of their time and, 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 and yours. You have two things that have recently come out, uh, your 2024 dance and calendars uh, released, right? And, and people mm -hmm. can get that at what website can they go to? They can go to my website, danceonphotos.com so it's d-a-n-s-u-n it's the first three letters of my first and last name uh, dot com and on the very top is a link for a bookstore so there you can get the calendars perfect and, and uh, you also and just book. had and the new book is portraits of an emergency chapter four chapter four yeah i just picked it up from um i just signed all the pre the special pre-orders a couple of days ago at my publishers so i'm pretty excited about that those are all going to be uh mailed out they've already been mailed out they said so but i have that's finally come out. I'm really excited about that. Very proud of that book. Um, thank you for sharing that. And for, for the listeners that uh, don't know where they're going yet, don't know what their next move is, um, you can always get in touch with me at uh, emsimprov at gmail.com. You can get with me through Gems and their editors. Um, Daniel, I'm sure there's a way to reach you. Um, and I don't know how you refer people that need help or are asking for guidance, but do they go to the website mm -hmm. and just say, Hey, I listened to you on the podcast and I need help. Yep. And then you I have a whole go. network. I have a whole network. So I'm like, where are you from? And I have, like we were talking about earlier, having a network, how important that is. Yeah. We get cons we get emails often from people that, Hey, I just need some help. And I ask where they are and I have access to, to support systems in their area. I have a whole database on that stuff. Wonderful. And if there's ever anybody that you uh, that reaches out to you from the Oklahoma City metro area uh, in the organizations, both uh, public safety and, and therapy counseling uh, individuals that I'm in a relationship with, if there's somebody that uh, where you might in your database doesn't have as much information, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Okay. I can get I'll that get up. add you in there. I can get that up to you as well. Um, okay. 
I just want to say thank you uh, very much for the opportunity, the time for you sharing uh, something that was brand new to me and, and for you to, to kind of roll with the punches. Uh, is that dealing with your uh, medical retirement uh, due to PTS or PTSD? So um, I humbly uh, and, and graciously and gratefully say thank you for sharing that on, on the podcast. Um, I want to just also say and, and give you the last couple of minutes before I do my outro to uh, anything that you would like to offer to the listeners here as we uh, prepare to, to say adieu. Yeah, well, first, thanks, Eric, for having me on your show. You know, I think one of the more um, areas that we have for people to hear about mental health and normalize it and hear people talking about it, the better. And yeah, I think like my thing is being tragically optimistic, really getting into things. Uh, that's where the change is going to happen. Unfortunately, I know many people feel that they are in a, they're not in a safe environment where they can do that, uh, which is really unfortunate, but I think resources are opening up all around the world for people that can reach out uh, for that. So I'm grateful for organizations like yours where that is becoming available to them, uh, where they can reach out to you and and get help. I think that's really important. And um, yeah, I think just normalizing it. And for me, it was... Being medically retired, as horrible as it was at the time, probably saved my life. Right? So it's not, when I look back on it, I don't look at it as a horrible thing. It's something that had to happen. And because of that, I am now going into a new whole other career path, which has totally reinvigorated me, where I'm not being re-traumatized. Um, now I'm actually being fulfilled, and I have a sense of value and purpose and it's been wonderful. It's like you, it's like when, God, how can I describe? If you think of when I, when I think of post traumatic growth and the possibilities of change, and I bring this up on my presentation, if you think of the superhero origin stories, and like, yeah, sure, that's not real, but you think of Superman or, or Batman who sees his parents get murdered and he does what he does. and Spider-Man and the Hulk and Wonder Woman, all these superhero origin stories are post-traumatic growth. Like, sure, they're not, it's not, the idea isn't foreign. We all know about it. But I see it so often in our peers. Uh, and I travel around the world and I see post-traumatic growth being displayed in so many of us. That's where I get the speakers from my conference, my post-traumatic growth conference. They're not psychologists. They're not mental health professionals. There are peers that I witnessed and I've experienced that I can see the amazing things they're doing that I invite them to come and talk about their experiences. So my message is you, it's definitely possible to recover, but it's also possible to thrive from the experiences that we've had in trauma. And it's wow. like this giant silver gold lining around a dark cloud that some of us can't always see. Again, what I hear is let's be tragically optimistic and let's thrive in post-traumatic growth. Um, this is and has been the EMS Improv Podcast where we have engaged, where we've tried to be mindful. Daniel has shared and told some stories. Um, we are powered by GEMS. I am Eric Chase. Daniel, it has been a pleasure and an honor to share time with you and for our listeners. And I, and I hope that a peace which surpasses all understanding with you, sir. Great. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate it.